Brechtenweil Weil has almost become a trademark for the entire era of the Weimar Republic. And we think of them as Rogers and Hammerstein or Gilbert and Sullivan. They almost come out in the same breath. But actually, their relationship was very difficult, and it lasted only four years when they collaborated sort of nonstop. Brecht was, like Fassbinder, much later, uh, and I think Fassbinder modeled himself a little on Brecht. He, you know, he ran around in, in proletarian clothes and a leather jacket and tried to be an enfant terrible within uh, Berlin society. And uh, also, you know, felt there were few rules for him. He was sexually very promiscuous. He uh, lived uh, in lots of different places. He had no real home and uh, you know, basically uh, lived the artist, the life of a bohemian artist. I w was his assistant on a production of Mother Courage in Munich in 1950. Uh, so I learned, uh, since I was at every rehearsal, I learned a lot about his actual way of working, and I, I was very impressed with it. Although I see what people like Kurt Weill and others have against Brecht as a person, that wasn't thrust at me. So I, I, I never was one of those that greatly disapproved of him. Brecht was a strong personality. And uh, when you d d had discussions with him, uh, his point of view usually won out, no matter who he was talking to. Brecht had eigentlich im Grunde uh, die Gegensätze nicht wirklich zusammenbringen wollen. Er hat nicht harmonisieren wollen, sondern er wollte die Gegensätze aufdecken. Er wollte sie sozusagen krass und grell in Scheinwerferlicht stellen und es dem Leser seiner Stücke oder dem Zuschauer, dem Publikum überlassen, selbst sich zu bewegen dann. It goes back to the 1920s, early 1920s, when in London there was a very successful production of the old Berger's Opera from the 18th century, it suddenly revived, and in its sharply, almost cynical mood, suited post-war, post-that war, London, and uh, Brecht's girlfriend and secretary, etc., Elizabeth Hauptmann, heard about this London success, and she knew English. And she made a translation of the Beggar's Opera, which was the beginning of the story. Three Penny Opera was based on John Gay's play, The Beggar's Opera. And that play, which was a very satirical play, his bete noire was, of course, the aristocracy, because it is, in fact, before the rise of the bourgeoisie. Brecht, uh, knew of the play, and then he reworked the play, added the songs, uh, changed it substantially, and added characters, and, and made it his own, and actually then made the bourgeoisie the middle class. Brecht was always known as the great adapter. Some people said uh, a thief, even, uh, more than adapter. Uh, I think it was Kurt Tuchelsky who said that uh, Breck stole, but he stole with genius. And in this case, uh, he took Elizabeth Hauptmann's literal translation of the Beggar's Opera and added in uh, adaptations of ballads by Villon and Kipling and cobbled together this uh, script that was still known right up almost until opening night as uh, the Beggar's Opera. His plays, they're often his songs surrounded by a narrative. And, this, and this, the songs are, of course, the lyrics, the poems. These are not decorative and incidental to his plays, nor are they s slight, like lyrics in a musical comedy. They're the pillars of society. He had started writing plays right after World War I. Um, his first plays are, are thought of as, as both very um, uh, expressionistic and nihilistic, very dark plays like uh, Manis Man, uh, which had Peter Lorre in it. That was his first big role. And uh, In the Jungle of the Cities, 
These were plays that had many angry young men in them, and but who did not really have a political point of view. He was he was really just kind of as many uh, artists at that age, and especially given the the tragedies of World War One, were just revolting against everything. Um, he he's coming to the end of that period when he writes. Uh, the Three Penny Opera, and uh, collaborates with Kurt Weill on the music. In 1927, Kurt Weill was supporting himself primarily as being a critic for the German radio broadcasting network, and he wrote a weekly column. And it was his job to listen to radio programs and to preview and review them. And in 1927, there was a broadcast of a play called Modest Mann by Bertolt Brecht, and Weil reviewed it and said, this is the drama and poetry of our time. And he um, got hold of a copy of a book of poetry that had just been published by Brecht called The House Postilla, meant a little home prayer book. And in it, he found these poems called the Mahagoni Songs. And at that time, Weil had a commission from a, a prestigious music festival in Baden-Baden to write a short one-act opera. And he went to Brecht, arranged for a meeting, and said, I want to use these poems. And Brecht said, OK. Brecht was known as a poet. And Kurt Weil was known as uh, a mostly still rather classical composer. They both became known to the general public th through the Three Penny Opera. They both were known to a, a clique, or a little more than a clique, the avant-garde, shall we say, before that. So we start with Brecht the Poet, whose friend has translated this play, and they offer it to a producer who's looking for a new play. And that was how the first production happened in 1928. At this point, he realizes he, he's, he's writing a new work. And he says, can I offer my friend Kurt Weil, with whom he'd already worked on something else, uh, the, the music? Can I have Kurt Weil do new music? The Beggar's Opera had something like 65 songs in it. And most of them, if not all of them, were already pre-existent tunes, folk tunes, hymns, opera arias that John Gay fitted out with new lyrics. And it's interesting because even then, it was a clash between the what would have been familiar to the audience as the old lyrics with these new lyrics, so that uh, London is a fair town uh, or a fair city became our Polly is a sad slut in, in John Gay's version. Uh, so that I think that gave Weil and Brecht an idea about how to use music in the Three Penny Opera. The score started, uh, in Weil's case, with uh, an overture that was meant to resemble an 18th century Baroque overture, but with wind instruments, so it would sound cheap and tawdry and not authentic. And then it started with Mr. Peacham's Morning Anthem, which is literally one of the tunes in Beggar's Opera. And so the audience would think they were hearing the Beggar's Opera. Now, Today, we don't hear it that way because at the last minute, really three days before opening, the actor who was playing McKeith said, I need an entry number. And Weil and Brecht didn't want to give him an entry number, but they said, well, well, we'll have a prologue. And that became, of course, the famous Moritat or Mac the Knife, which uh, presented all of the crimes and deeds that McKeith supposedly had committed before the, the play begins. <laughs> In the Three Penny Opera, Weil included all sorts of dance idioms and popular song 
uh, forms such as the tango and the foxtrot and the Charleston and the Boston waltz and so forth. And I think that accounted for a lot of the popularity of the piece. The audience loved the tunes. On opening night, there was no reaction whatsoever to the play. Everyone thought it was going to be a dud until Canonan's song, the canon song, came along, and it had to be encored immediately. The audience went crazy. John is gestorben, Jimmy is gone. Well, George is vermisst and verdorben. But Ruth is still not broke. Julian Eve gets wieder geworben. Soldaten wohnen auf den Kanonen von Kamp bis Kutschbehaar. Wenn es mal regnete und es beging ihnen neue Rasse, braune oder blasse, da machen sie vielleicht darauf ihr Blitzen. Though the various crises had come just before the production of the kind that always happen in theater, you know, actors sick, actors declaring they wouldn't sing a song, uh, every kind of crisis that might have created a flop. Uh, well, it, instead it, it caught on and had a, r ran in repertory and, until it was banned by Hitler in 33. When the audience walked into the Theater am Schiff Bauerdamm on opening night, they knew they were going to see something very different because there was no orchestra in the pit. It was on stage. And it wasn't a typical orchestra that you would find in a German theater. It was a jazz band. It was the Lewis Ruth Band. And these seven players played 23 different instruments, which was not something that you would also find in an opera orchestra, but that sort of doubling of a clarinet player who played sax and flute and bassoon gave Vile an incredible flexibility to write numbers that were in imitation of American dance music, but also to do a Baroque sounding overture and a Mozart sounding aria and the finales that were meant to parody uh, finales from 18th century opera. Brecht and Weil, uh collaborated on uh, Mahogany and that play was, uh, I think, they thought of as more serious and, and already a little more political. And whereas this, really, they tried to incorporate um, cabaret and vaudeville. And, and I think both of them probably were writing this also to make money, that they, they understood that in, in the you know, Berlin of the 1920s, which was also the Roaring Twenties in Berlin, that this kind of uh, slightly nihilistic, certainly cynical uh, play that had lots of music in it and, 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 and functioned more like a cabaret would be a success. And of course, it was a huge hit when it opened in 1928. You can attribute the popularity of Beggar's Opera 95% to Kurt Weill and only five to Mr. Brecht, as far as popularity is concerned. Nevertheless, I think Mr. Brecht has a play there, uh, even, if there were no, even if there was no music, even if they just recited the lyrics. Uh, artistically speaking, but it wouldn't be as popular, because how can how can poems and so on ca catch on the, the way this music can? So, uh, Kurt Weill was um, gifted that way. Like, there hadn't been anything quite that, to my, in, to my mind, uh, so sweepingly effective. Here we have the greatest poet and dramatist of his generation and one of the greatest young composers in Germany. The very fact that they were collaborating on musical theater was something of a first. And of course, there was the inevitable struggle. What's more important, the music or the words? Breck kept saying, your music just washes out my poetry. And, and indeed, Weil's music, I think, does do that. And that's both what Brecht objected to, but it's also what gives those works such a unique sort of tension that one still confronts every time one sees them on stage today. Kurt Weill's 
songs are could be called quite conservative in many ways. I think the the, the very uh, catchy and touching tunes, you know, they have a, a touch of melancholy and people dote on them and like, um, these are songs in the tradition of the 1890s, the Victorian ballads. They have nothing to do with jazz per se. I mean, he said to be a jazz composer, there's only a slight element of jazz. Weil decided that he didn't want to write music for a very limited audience anymore. He thought that if music was going to have any justification for existence, it had to reach out in this new climate, the Weimar Republic, to a much wider audience. So he started to think in terms of writing for radio and film, and especially the theater, because he thought that was the place where music would continue to live rather than simply to exist in a museum, which he felt the concert hall had become. In the theater of the 1920s, uh, there are many attempts to break out of the molds of traditional naturalistic theater. They're doing theater in the round. They're doing a lot of things to break up this, this kind of realistic proscenium arch. And I think Brecht's play fits very much into this mold of, of using uh, what were considered vulgar forms, cabaret, vaudeville, etc. These are vulgar forms or the cabaret singer Ernst Busch comments throughout the play, uh, this way of breaking up the action and the illusion of a theatrical space, and also breaking up this notion of high and low culture and bringing them together. Der Mensch lebt durch den Kopf, der Kopf reicht ihm nichts aus. Versuch es nur von deinem Kopf. They put things together, Brecht and Weil, I mean, uh, a lot of different things that hadn't been assembled quite in that way, certainly. Like, the way that Kurt Weill is both a classical and a popular composer is very important. Brecht didn't have that mixture in the same way. Brecht's plays had only been success for the avant-garde and such, and small productions. I think his early plays, plays before he became a communist, are uh, works of real genius and landmarks in theater history. But uh, they didn't make any money. They weren't seen by large audiences. So there's, there's this difference between the two. And naturally, it, it, um, it, so the two were not a happily married pair any more than Gilbert and Sullivan were but they, they were the um, sweet and the sour. And, and it uh, could Weil after he, after he and Lotte decided uh, they disapproved of Mr. Brecht, not just politically, but as a person. They said, this, Kurt said, I still want to work with him because I respect his work. See, the, it was Brecht's talent, not his views and not even his personality. Part of the new aesthetic of epic theater that Dry Groschenoper was an early representative of is that the songs do not sort of continue the action, at least most of them don't. Brecht and Weil wanted to always remind people that they were in the theater. This isn't real life. It was anti-naturalistic, anti-realistic, and therefore when a song would start, a placard would come in with the title or the lyrics, the lights would change, the singer would step downstage, and you know there'd be a, a real sense that something new is starting now. And therefore, I think that the, the vocal style was also a way to distance the audience. Distance is probably the wrong word. The German word verfremt means to make something seem strange. 
and something familiar seems strange. So it's the idea that a character breaking into song in Rodgers and Hammerstein in the 40s, the idea was to move imperceptibly from dialogue to song. In the Three Penny Opera, you want as much break between them uh, in terms of style and presentation as possible. He would write whole poems, sometimes filling one page when printed. And the composer would have to invent and get something new for the whole thing. Kurt Weill would collaborate with that, even adding things that came from his musical background, like he would end each act with the kind of finale which the opera tradition had used at least as early as Mozart. The, the, the finale is, is defined in this context as an end of act which brings all the actors on to sing not just in unison but also in separate b bunches. And Mozart perfected those, he did a, quite a number. And they are, that is a feature of Three, three Penny Opera. The Three Penny Opera was sure to be a flop. Everyone was expecting that the critics would roast it, that the audience would hate it. After all, Brecht had never had a successful play. In fact, that was his trademark, that he only had scandals and riots. And Weill was known as this highbrow opera composer. So the vultures were circling and no one could quite know what to do when the audience loved it. Most of all, Brecht himself. He was just starting his Marxist studies at that point in 1927, and the worldwide success of this commercial pot boiler that the left-wing newspapers said had no socio-political uh, value whatsoever, it became a terrible embarrassment for him. And so he had to somehow try to remake the Three Penny Opera in his new image. And he did that, first of all, by rewriting it as a literary version and publishing that in 1930. And then he thought that the film version would give him another opportunity to refunction this play as a Marxist critique of society. Mein Vater erzählte mir seinerzeit, dass ähm, er 1928, als die Uraufführung am Theater am Schiffbauer Damm in Berlin war, von der drei Oper von Brecht, er dabei war, er dieses Stück gesehen hat und auch Nebenzahl, der spätere Produzent des Films, neben ihm saß. Und äh, nach dem Stück war mein Vater sehr beeindruckt und, und hat also zum Nebenzahl gesagt, das wäre doch ein Film. Ihr, die ihr euren Wand und unsere Brachheit liebt, das eine wisset ein für allemal, wie ihr es immer dreht und wie ihr es immer schiebt. Erst kommt das Fressen, dann kommt die Moral. The film of Three Penny Opera, I think, is a classic. And I don't know of any other documentation of Weill's work that is so successful in its own way. I think all film versions of musicals have to be radical adaptations if they're to be successful. Just filming a stage production or a stage version would not work. It's a different medium. If you go to the film expecting to see the Three Penny Opera, the stage version, you'll be disappointed. Half the music isn't there, the plot has changed, the emphasis is quite different from what it was, and you won't get a sense of why this became the most popular play in the German language. But I do think it is a wonderful document of the period and certainly um, a milestone in film history. Neurofilm was founded in 1925 by Seymour Nabensal's father, originally. And they first started making Harry Peel adventure films. And he makes his several films for them. Abwege, uh, Crisis, uh, with Brigitte de Helm, which is a kind of a women's melodrama. Uh, the White Hell of Pitz Palou, which Pops co-directs with Arnold Funk. And then his his really important 
early sound trilogy made up of Kameradschaft, uh, Comrades, and uh, West Front 1918, which is a film about World War I, and then, of course, Three Penny Opera. Dieses Projekt wurde tatsächlich dann aufgegriffen und entwickelt. Und ähm, es kam dann auch zu der Frage, ob die Rechte zu haben sind. Und unter gewissen Auflagen war das möglich, die Rechte zu bekommen. Nämlich ähm, der Mitarbeit von Brecht, was man ja auch annehmen kann, der Mitarbeit von Brecht am Drehbuch und der Mitgestaltung äh, durch Kurt Weil, was die Musik anlangt und die Songs anlangt. When Simon Lebensal bought Three Penny Opera, of course, he, from Brecht, he signed a contract with Brecht that Brecht would deliver a script which was basically the play translated into the film medium because as a, as a film producer, he wanted to bring to his audience the hit stage play. It was a huge success. The producers, had, what they'd bought was a, a stage show that they wanted to film. They didn't want the whole play rewritten with, with a somewhat changed philosophy that Brecht was offering. In this period, he was getting to be more and more a communist, so to speak. He was a big student of Marxism, and he, he wanted to ch change Becker's opera even more than he already had in the direction of making it a flat-out critique of capitalism. That was why there was going to be war. He didn't realize that when producers buy a property, it's that one, the one they say, the one they saw in Berlin, not something he might write later. And so he really completely revised the, the play in his film treatment, removing numerous characters, um, turning the character of Mackie, Messer, uh, Mac the Knife from a criminal and a degenerate into um, a more of a middle-class character because he wanted to make this equation between gangsters or criminals and capitalists. That was his goal. And of course, Nebensal gets the script and Pop sees it, and it's not what they wanted. And so uh, that's where the conflict starts. Brecht war überhaupt zu keiner Konzession bereit, hat also die Unterredung abgebrochen und daraufhin hat die Filmfirma äh, Brecht verklagt, soweit ich weiß, ähm, wegen Vertragsbruch. Then, after Brecht is, is really off the project, uh, Nebensal and Pops bring in Bella Balaj, who is hung a Hungarian writer, and the two of them rework it, and they, they really go back to the original stage play with Brecht's treatment and, and, and start mixing things together, using elements from, the, from Brecht's treatment, but also bringing back many of the elements from the original play. In Brecht's treatment, it ends with a vision of revolution, with the proletariat rising up against the bourgeoisie. In the film version, it ends completely differently because you have Polly saving Mac the Knife from hanging and also having formed the Citibank, there is an alliance between the Citibank under Polly her father, Peachum, Mac the Knife, and, and Brown working as capital to keep the uh, proletariat, you know, where, in their place. But as the communist critics complain of Mr. Brecht, he doesn't know a proletarian when he sees one. He thinks the lumpen proletariat, the rags and tatters, beggars people, are it. He never learned what real workers are. He never ha was able to have that. He only knew Bohemia. You know, he only knew Greenwich Village, not the Bronx. <laughs> Mr. Pabst has another idea, which is 
to use the film's power to handle a mob, a crowd, which as you couldn't easily do on stage, perhaps at all, and to take the beggars seriously as a possible revolt. Still, if you will, bringing a social message, because we're on the side of the beggars, only it's all twisted through the, the plot. But, uh, and I, I think that the new element he introduced of the, the beggars in the film, n not present, in the stage version is, is quite effective. Also, was mir also aufgefallen ist, als ich den Film jetzt wieder gesehen habe, also nach vielen Jahren, ist, dass also diese Schärfe und Illusionslosigkeit des Brechtschen Theaterstückes in dem Film eine, eine ganz andere Wendung nimmt, weil ähm, die filmischen Mittel dazu führen, dass man sich mit den Figuren viel mehr identifiziert. Ähm, so, dass der Mackie Messer gar nicht mal so total unsympathisch ist. Man kann sich nicht vorstellen, dass er ein Lustmörder ist oder so. Kann man sich wirklich echt nicht vorstellen, obwohl er so ein, ein natürlich dieser, dieser Gentleman-Gangster, also... Ähm, schon äh, ist faustig hinter den Ohren hat. Polly Peachen? Mackie, ist das die Tochter vom alten Peachen? Mackie, du willst dem alten Peachen die Tochter wegnehmen? Mackie, Mackie! Genial, der Schluss des Films, der ja nicht im Theaterstück drin ist. Ähm, die Idee, dass sie also eine Bank gründen und äh, gemeinsam äh, sozusagen die, die Leute ausnehmen, und, 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 und das Geld der Leute in die Tasche stecken, ohne dass sie jetzt einbrechen müssen. Der ärmste Mann London, der reiche Mecki Messer. Sollten Sie nicht zusammengehen? Das könnte man als Versuch deuten, dass in dieser Weimarer Republik, in der also Linke und Rechte sich gegenseitig als Verbrecher hingestellt haben, eine Art Modell geschaffen wird, ähm, die Leute, die sich vorher ruinieren wollten, entscheiden sich zusammenzuarbeiten. Hallo, Jackie! Hallo, Mackie! Also auf dieser oberen Ebene der Macht, verquickt natürlich auch mit, mit Kriminalität, wird eine, werden Brücken gebaut zwischen den gegensätzlichen Parteien. Aber das, was vollkommen ungelöst ist, ist sozusagen die, der Gegensatz zwischen oben und unten. Das heißt zwischen arm und reich. Der Schlusssong, und die einen sind im Licht und die anderen sind im Dunkeln. Man sieht nur die im Lichte, die im Dunkeln sieht man nicht. Es ist ein wunderbarer Schluss des Films. Die einen sind im Dunkeln und die anderen Man sieht die im Lichte, die im Dunkeln sieht man nicht. Brecht accused the Nero Film Company of breaking contracts by, by not producing his treatment. And he said, It was his right to have written that treatment, and that's what they were supposed to produce. But, of course, the original contract had said that what the play was, what the film was supposed to be, was an ad adaptation of the original stage play, not of Brecht's treatment. And that's what the conflict was about. And, of course, Brecht lost because if you looked at the original contract, it indeed said that it was the stage play that was to be adapted and not Brecht's totally rewritten treatment. Kurt Weil was concerned on a very concrete matter, namely that they only used parts of his score. 
and they misused part in that they, they used as background music what was actually the music of a song. In the stage version of Three Penny Opera, there's about 55 minutes of music total. In the film, there's 28 and a half minutes. So that's almost exactly 50% that doesn't appear in the film. And even what does appear in the film is quite different in terms of either placement, who sings it, or its function. For example, the tango ballad, which probably contained the lyric that was the most offensive. Uh, I think that was not included in the film as a vocal because uh, the censors wouldn't have let it through. So it became a, a piano dance piece used in the brothel. Same thing with the Ballad of the Easy Life. That became just piano background music in the tavern scene. And because Lucy doesn't even appear at all in the film, none of her music made it into the film, so no jealousy duet. And for some reason, they decided that they would give Jenny, or the role played by Lada Lenya, the Pirate Jenny song, taking it out of the stable scene for Polly. And that started this performance tradition, thinking that Jenny always sang Pirate Jenny. But in fact, she didn't until the film. And now this still presents a problem for people who are doing the stage version because everyone expects, including the actors who are cast, and you usually cast someone pretty famous in the role of Jenny, uh, they expect to do Pirate Jenny. But Lenny always said any production of Three Penny Opera in which Jenny is a major role has something wrong with it right from the start. Stimmt hatte, sondern das war praktisch eine, eine wirkliche kollektive, ähm, kreative Zusammenarbeit. Also es gab zum einen ähm, das Drehbuch, ähm, was also Lücken aufgewiesen hat und, und nicht wirklich fertig war. Zum anderen gab es äh, das Libretto des Stückes und zum dritten ähm, gab es also die, den Brechtschen Beitrag, der sozusagen noch nicht verbunden äh, da lag und äh, was also bei den Dreharbeiten dann tatsächlich genommen wurde, ähm, ein Stück äh, vom Theaterstück oder ein Stück aus dem Drehbuch oder ein Stück von dem, was Brecht beigesteuert hat, das war nicht festgelegt, sondern das ist äh, spontan oft aus dem Moment heraus entschieden worden. Eben die Musik noch von Kurt Weil dazu kam. Diese, diese romantischen ähm, äh, und, und doch irgendwie auch äh, so ähm, ein bisschen dekadenten Lieder und diese dekadente äh, Musik mit Absicht, äh, natürlich das Bürgertum auch irgendwie ähm, kritisierend oder illustrierend, aber auch ähm, die Liebe wieder zu dieser, zu dieser Musik. Also das hat diese Atmosphäre enorm äh, Intensiviert. Some of Brecht's ideas as to how to translate this work into the medium of film are unrealistic. There are many, many characters, many more than you could have in a film where you need to focus the audience's attention more on, you know, a, a group of characters that they can quickly identify and know what role they play in the film. And so that's what Pops does. He eliminates uh, the characters, Ed, as Brecht already had in his treatment, and he focuses the narrative much more on a, on a, um, a th three male characters. You have uh, Peachum, Brown, and Mackie Messer, and then Polly, who's, who's Peachum's daughter, who plays a, uh, a much less significant role in the stage play as she does finally in... Pops film. Der Vater sagte, dass also die, die Original-Theaterschauspieler, ähm, Brecht-Schauspieler wie Lotte Lenia, ähm, dann äh, die Carola Nea, dass die eine, eine so 
starke Drei-Groschen-Oper-Atmosphäre allein durch ihre Anwesenheit geschaffen haben, dass das also wirklich gezündet hat während der Dreharbeiten und dass diese Atmosphäre übergesprungen ist wie ein Funken auf die anderen Schauspieler. Und vieles wurde improvisiert, also manche Sätze wurden wirklich einfach erstmal erfunden während der Dreharbeit und er sagte auch, dass immer das Theaterstück, also das Libretto von dem Theaterstück da lag und, und man hat das einfach in die Hand genommen, hat immer wieder einfach Sätze aus dem Theaterstück hineingenommen. One of the things that Brecht didn't consider, which perhaps, which is very important in relation to Pabst, Pabst had the movie maker's job of thinking, how do I translate this into images? When you film something, That's why you should never film Shakespeare, uh, because he's done everything in words. A, a screenplay should never be complete the way Shakespeare is complete. It should leave openings for the real drama to take over, of doing it into images. Brecht was only like all the geniuses. He was an egomaniac. He had to think that his idea was better, and he knew very little about film. And Pops is one of the group of people, and there were probably not more than a, a dozen in Germany, who, in the silent era, had worked out a whole aesthetic, a whole way of how you, how you translate something like a drama or a novel into moving images. They discovered the amazing things you could do. And Mr. Brecht, of course, wasn't looking for that. He was looking for his own play, done again, with changes to make it more communistic. He, he says that uh, the fact that uh, perhaps made it t too romantic and too sentimental, of course, made it more popular. In other words, Brecht despises the real public while claiming to admire the proletariat, you know. Once the film was done, it, it came into the theaters, and it did not, it was not a major hit. I am not sure whether it actually lost a lot of money, but it certainly didn't make anything like the kind of money that the, the play had. This may have had something to do with the fact that by 1931, the play, the play was already several years old, and you know, in the fast-moving world of Berlin theater and cinema, that's already old. Uh, secondly, I think it also has to do with the fact that in early 30s Berlin, things are changing politically. Um, the National Socialists are, have, by that time, entered into the parliament and become um, a strong party, not the majority party yet. And so the whole atmosphere is very different. And the kind of cynical attitudes you had in the 1920s that were, in some senses, also very happy-go-lucky and not really worrying about serious issues like politics, that's very different in the early 30s when the depression is hit, you have huge numbers of people unemployed, and people are really worried about what is going to happen. And so this kind of frivolity of the play is, is no longer you know, au courant. When Vio died, the Three Penny Opera was pretty much unknown in the United States. There had been a production in 1933 on Broadway. It lasted 13 performances. It was the middle of the Depression. They had duplicated the Berlin production. It made no sense to an American audience. And then the film had shown here in 1931 in the Warner Brothers uh, Theater here in New York. And it, too, made almost no impact. I have a program from that, uh, the premiere of the film in the United States, and there's a synopsis, and it reads something like, um, the Al Capone of merry old England, Mickey Messer, uh, dot, dot, dot. And so uh, I think there was a lot of confusion about the piece. And of course, Weil and Brecht talked about doing the Three Penny Opera on Broadway in the 1940s. But Weil, I think, quite rightly said, you know, it won't work. This is German. Anything German is not going to play very well on Broadway. So it wasn't until after Weil's death that Mark Blitzstein 
brought to Lenya a translation of the Three Penny Opera. Leonard Bernstein had a, a creative arts festival up at Brandeis, and Lenya went up to that, and it was a concert version, and she sang the role of Jenny in Blitzstein's translation. And it was so successful that there were a lot of producers who said, we want to do it, either on Broadway or off Broadway, but they all wanted to update it, change it, and so forth. And eventually, two young people with no production credits at all came along and said, we want to do it just the way it was. And we'll do it off Broadway. They rented the theater Delice in 1954. Limited run, 11 weeks, another play was coming in. Well, the rest is legend. It ran 2,611 performances. It uh, was the first cast album of an off-Broadway play, and it sold more albums than any musical up to that point except My Fair Lady. And that really started what we call the vile renaissance, because if this was an unknown piece and had that sort of potential, what else don't we know about Vile's European works? And so, one by one, uh, Lenya recorded them, Happy End, Seven Deadly Sins, The Rise and Fall of the City of Mahagoni, and they became standard repertory theater and opera pieces. Siehst du den Mond über Suho? It is a watered-down vision of the play if your notion is that the play be translated successfully. And one of the major elements that I would say is watered-down is the fact that the, the kind of cabaret atmosphere, and especially the fact that so many of the songs, and the Brecht's vile songs are, are really quite wonderful, that they are missing from the film version. It is no longer really a, a musical the way the original stage play was. And in terms of content, the stage play is really too cynical um, and too scattered in terms of its critique to really function as a Marxist work. And that in some ways, Pops, who was, who was not a communist, he, but he was a leftist, that he is indeed ultimately presenting a more unified kind of Marxist vision in his film than in the original play. There is that equation between capital and, you know, and criminality, and that the exploitation of the proletariat, or even the exploitation of the, the lower middle classes by big capital is criminal. And that clearly comes out in, in the film the way it certainly does not in the original stage play. Did Weil and Brecht like the finished movie despite all those things, I mean in private? I think they liked it. Uh, if they would have done a movie, it probably would have uh, been a completely, uh, they would have had a complete different conception. But I think Pabst did an extraordinary job with that uh, movie, which still remains on, on the top list of the 10 best movies ever made.